my name is Matthew Crane. This is my family, my wife Ashley, and my kids Israel, Judah, Ezra. I am the station manager of Final Fight Bible Radio. Final Fight Bible Radio is an online, internet-based, King James, Bible-believing, conservative, Christian radio station <laughs> unlike any other station out there. What makes us so different is that Final Fight Bible Radio isn't your typical, soft, limp-wristed, so-called Christian radio station. We are polemic rather than apologetic. We are aggressive rather than defensive. And we are interested in earnestly contending for the yes. faith. Amen. Final Fight Bible Radio began with one man's vision and another man's idea. Brian Gaines is a Christian man with a great zeal for God's work. Amen. Years ago, he began to have a burden about getting the word of God to the multitudes of all the nations of the world. He considered internet radio, but he had few computer skills and didn't know how to make this happen. Around that same time, I had come up with an idea to put together an online shared folder where Bible school graduates could upload and download each other's sermons for the purpose of encouraging one another. When I told Brian about it, the Lord told him, that's the guy for the internet radio station. Brian invited me to lunch, told me about his idea, and asked me if I would pray about it as he loaded hundreds of dollars worth of radio equipment into the back of my car. <laughs> During that first year, I put a lot of time and work into building an internet radio station, and this was on top of my full-time secular job and ministry responsibilities at the church. It became increasingly obvious that operating a radio station of this caliber was going to be a full-time job in and of itself, and that working a full-time secular job while operating the station wasn't a sustainable option. So I began to earnestly pray that the Lord would show me if this was indeed what he wanted me to pursue. One Sunday morning, Josh Millar, missionary to Ethiopia, came through our church and caught my attention with a sermon about the importance of knowing what God wants you to do, which was exactly what I was trying to figure out. Later that same evening, we made a last-minute decision to drive up to Faith Baptist Church in Chehalis, Washington, and attend their Sunday evening service. Since we arrived 45 minutes early, there weren't very many people there yet, and as I stepped through the doors, I was greeted by a mentally handicapped saint named Dean. Before I could say hello, Dean walked up, spasmodically shook my hand, and said, You need to start a Christian radio station. Oh, no way. Understandably, I was shocked. At the time, there were only a handful of people that even knew about the project, wow. and so I asked him if someone had told him about it, but he simply said, No, I just knew the moment you walked through that door uh -huh. that you were wow. the guy Amen. to start the radio station. So, on July 4th, 2014, in a tiny garage closet in Scappoose, Oregon, Final Fight Bible Radio officially went on the air. Amen. Over the last three years, the Lord has led us to take many steps of faith, and we've run into many obstacles that seemed insurmountable. But through it all, the Lord has been faithful. We've watched the station grow to an audience numbering into the thousands, and daily we have listeners that tune in from all around the world. Now, Final Fight Bible Radio emphasizes three things that is severely lacking in modern Christian radio. We emphasize the Gospel, the King James Bible, and foreign missions. Now, this shouldn't be a novel thing for Christian radio, but sadly it is. Out of all the Christian radio stations out there, conservative, contemporary, or otherwise, how many of them preach the gospel? I mean a clear-cut, convicting right. presentation of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, for your sins, without which salvation, your eternal destination is a fiery oh, hell. Right. How many Christian radio stations do you know of that make any attempt at helping or promoting foreign missionaries? And how many Christian stations take a firm stand on the King James Bible, much less even read from the Bible on their station? On Final Fight Bible Radio, all day, every day, you'll hear music that glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ and not you. Amen. King James Amen. Bible believing preaching and teaching, frequent scripture quotations, reminders to pray for missionary families, frequent short presentations of the gospel, encouragement and instruction on public evangelism, short salvation testimonies of Christians from all over the world, comparisons between the King James Bible and other modern Bible versions, promotions of various missionary projects, and much yes, more. Sir, that's right. Furthermore, we have already begun the work of creating additional Bible-believing Christian radio stations in foreign languages for the purpose of assisting the missionaries in their fields. In October and November of 2016, we launched 
Glaubenskampf Bibel Radio in German and Alethius Faros Elinico Biblico Radiofono in Greek. There are over 80 million Germanic people in Europe and less than 20 Bible-believing missionaries. Wow. And in Greece, wow. there are over 11 million people and less than 10 Bible-believing missionaries. Wow. God's missionaries in these last days are grossly outnumbered. Yep. The vast majority of the people in these foreign countries around the world will never meet a Bible-believing missionary, yep. Yep. will never receive so much as a gospel tract wow. in their lifetime, will never have a clear presentation of the gospel spoken to them, will never really understand who Jesus Christ really is if they even hear of him at all. The whole world is pouring into hell, and there are simply not enough missionaries to reach them. And statistics show that there are more missionaries coming off of the field than there are going to the field. This is where we want to help. Through the use of internet radio, we can make the gospel of Jesus Christ and right Bible doctrine as close as an app on a cell phone. There might never be a church in this man's town, or a missionary in this girl's village, but through the use of globally available technology, we can put solid scriptural teaching and preaching Amen. into every Amen. corner of the country. Here's how it works. Since we cannot actually broadcast out of these countries for various technical and sometimes legal reasons, we broadcast these stations via the internet out of the USA. The missionaries supply me with content in their language on a regular basis, I then broadcast their material from Portland, Oregon, and the missionaries then promote the station to the people in their countries who can listen to it via an app on their smartphones. In addition to the Greek and German stations, we are currently working on a Russian and a Thai station, and we are also in contact with missionaries in regards to a Spanish, Korean, and Hebrew station. Amen. Just to be clear, these radio stations are not a replacement for churches or missionaries, Amen. nor do we believe that these radio stations are necessarily a fulfillment of the Great Commission. Technically, the Great Commission is a man on the ground who goes. These foreign radio stations are simply a valuable tool and an unprecedented gospel resource that we are placing into the hands of the missionaries. Our goal is to get as much truth as possible to as many people as possible as quickly as possible. We want to strengthen the body of Christ through the Word of God, attack sin, rebuke worldly Christianity, and give the gospel to as many lost people as we can before Jesus Christ returns. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been nearly 2,000 years since Jesus ascended into heaven. We are at the end of the church age. Apostasy is spreading. Evangelicals are surrendering. Christians are falling. Yes. We Bible believers are the final fighters of the church. Amen. We're asking for God's people to stand behind this ministry. Amen. By God's That's grace, good. we're pressing forward. But we could use your help, your participation, your prayers, your support. Would you ask the Lord if he would have you get involved with the ministry of Final Fight Bible Radio? The night is coming and the darkness is spreading. But the Lord Jesus Christ is coming soon and there's not much time left. Where do you stand in the final fight?
is so it's a blessing to be here. I, I love this church. I've never been here, but I've heard a lot about it. Love Brother Kim. Uh, I was telling my wife on the way here, it's such a blessing to be a Bible believing Christian because you have all these friends and contacts that you're you feel like you're a brother, you know, or they feel you feel like your family. Yeah. And really I've only I had only seen Brother Kim once before in my life and talked to him a couple times on the phone and internet. You know, I already felt like I had a direct connection to him. So Amen. that's the blessing of the body of Christ and it's a blessing to be here. I'm going to go ahead and preach to you for a few more few minutes here. Uh, before I get started though, does anybody have any questions about Final Five Bible Radio? I know I went kind of fast. I don't think I even introduced myself. <laughs> but uh, does anybody have any questions about yeah about the radio station? Um, if you're not familiar already, uh, you can download the app for free on the Apple App Store and Google Play Store. You can also get in on our text message alert. Sometimes we'll send out clips, new clips that we come up with. You'll be the first to hear them if you text uh, FIGHT to 77948. So you can get onto that uh, text subscription. doesn't cost anything, but anytime there's an update or anytime there's a new clip, I'll try to send it to those people first. And um, yeah, with that, let's go ahead and open our Bibles. Let's turn to First. Peter chapter 5. I believe that this is the sermon that the Lord would have me to preach this morning. It is some teaching and some preaching here. Um, it's always, I don't know, the last time I taught this, I was at our church not too long ago, and I had some problems around the time that I was teaching this series, and then uh, I've had some more problems when I decided this was the lesson I was going to teach on <laughs> this week. And uh, I, think, I don't think that's by accident. Uh, you know, my wife the other night, you know, was woken from a dead sleep by the feel of a cold hand grabbing her leg. And, uh, you know, I, was, I had a, what, the closest thing to a hardcore asthma attack that I've ever had in my life last night. And I don't have asthma. That's I could right. barely breathe. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of different stuff going on. Um, so I'm, the lesson I was going to teach on was on, uh, is on the devil and your adversary the devil and I don't think it's coincidence that I had all these problems last night I started sat down to study and uh, it turned out that the radio station crashed back home wow. but wow. the people at home who were whose job it was to alert me if the radio station ever goes down texted me except my phone died literally one minute before they texted me. Wow. So it was about a half hour before I got any information that the radio was down. Then we found out what the problem was and it was something that's never happened before. My uh, router at home just uh, went kaput, <laughs> you know, and, and it's a really expensive router. And so really just weird, weird stuff. And so it's just one of those things, but we're going to teach it this morning, going to preach it this morning. First Peter chapter five, the Bible says, verse eight, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Let's pray. Yes. Father, I come before you this morning. I do thank you, God, for your word. I thank you, God, for the privilege it is, God, to be able to open a Bible in this country and be able to read it for free and not have to worry about the police uh, busting down our doors. We do thank you for that, Father. Help us to take advantage of the freedom and liberty we have and continue to preach and teach the gospel. And I pray that you bless the service this morning. I trust you, Lord. I trust that this is what you want me to give to your people. I just pray you'd uh, help me to say the words that would be a blessing and be edifying. And I pray you give them understanding this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, All right, so uh, the devil is basically, I guess you'd say, the third enemy of the Christian. you got the world, the flesh, and the devil. And uh, I would say that the flesh is going to probably give you the most trouble just because it's with you at all times. But uh, the devil is certainly the most deadly. And uh, the Bible says that you're to be sober and you're to be vigilant. And the first and fourth first and foremost thing that you need to know and realize about the devil is that according to the Bible, he is interested in you. Yeah. Number one, he does exist. And just, he's just as real as God is. And uh, there's kind of a teaching that sort of goes around that I've heard over the years. You know, I've been in church for many, many years, decades now. And it's kind of this idea that, well, you know, the devil's not omnipresent, which is true. He's not omnipresent like God is. He can't be everywhere at once. But it's the idea that, well, you know, the devil's only interested in politics and the Pope. And he's he only kind of messes around with the big guys and he's never really going to give you any trouble because you're not that important and I'm not that important. But I don't agree with that. And part of that is because when Peter writes this, he's writing to the strangers that are in Bithynia and Cappadocia and Pontius and Galatia. And he tells those Christians who are no more 
diff no different than you and me. He tells them, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is looking about, seeking whom he may devour. And so he's giving them a warning. Listen, the devil is after you. Don't, take, don't, don't think for a second that he's not interested in you. Um, that is wrong. That is a, technically a contradiction of the Bible. And, in it, and that, I believe, is in and of itself a deception that was invented by the devil to trick Christians. <laughs> because if, let, let me ask you this, what better way is there to catch your prey than to trick them into thinking that the lion is far, far away and not interested in you? Um, you better have the attitude that he could strike at any moment. Yeah. Now, if I'm out there walking in the grasses of the African savanna, uh, I'm not going to assume there are no lions out there. Yeah. And I'm not going to assume there's no lions out to eat me. <laughs> um, I'm going to be sober-minded, and I'm going to be vigilant. And you say, why? Because I know how dangerous the situation is. Now, I'm not advocating paranoia this morning. There's a difference between paranoia and vigilance. Uh, paranoia is crippling and it prevents you from being able to operate it prevents you from being able to think straight um, and it often results in uh, hasty bad and impulsive decisions paranoia i'm not talking about that this morning i'm talking about vigilance vigilance keeps moving forward but it pays attention to the details vigilance looks for the red flags the lion's prints in different situations in life it doesn't rush into situations why because you're being vigilant you're looking to see if there's the adversary there you're, you're praying about things Things. You're approaching all things with prayer and scriptural consideration. It's cautious and circumspect. It's looking all around. Why? Because there's a lion out there ready to devour you. Um, the devil wants to mess me up. And the devil wants to mess you up. Listen, the devil's not stupid. He's wiser than Daniel, the Bible says. The Bible says he's full of subtlety and all mischief. And let me tell you this morning, it's not your life that he's against necessarily. He's not so much interested, I don't believe, in killing you. The devil can do so much more damage in destroying your effectiveness for the Lord. <clears throat> the devil is not out to end your life. He's out to neutralize you. He's out to end your effectiveness for Jesus Christ. Uh, why kill a backslidden Christian? I mean, their, their life can do so much more damage just letting them go than, yeah. and them going around calling themselves a Christian than it can them dying. The devil doesn't need to destroy your career. He can just, uh, he just needs to get you to lie about your hours. He just needs you to waste company resources and be a lazy worker. You're a lot more useful to the devil as a lousy Christian employer around lost people than you are home, alone, and unemployed. You see what I mean? Uh, the devil doesn't need to destroy your ministry. He just needs you to get the, to. He just needs you to quench the Holy Spirit through worldly compromise or unforsaken private sin. If you quench the Holy Spirit, if you're trying to minister and trying to serve the Lord and do something for God, and you quench the Holy Spirit in your life, you have no power. You have no ministry. You can't. The the flesh. There's nothing about the flesh that pleases God. You quench the Holy Spirit. You're now operating in the flesh, and nothing you can do can please God. And you're not going to get anywhere. And that's what the devil's after. He's after to neutralize you. The fact of the matter is, in these last days, the devil has been extremely effective in neutralizing the body of Christ yes. and short-circuiting their power. And uh, consequently, the majority of the Christians on this earth at this time are in the condition of what the Bible says the last days would be like. Yes. They're rich. They're increased with goods. They yes. think that they have need of nothing. And uh, they have no idea that they're poor and wretched and miserable and blind and naked. That's what the Bible says. Now, let me ask you this. Uh, if, a, if, if a lion has some prey that is blind and naked, <laughs> that's pretty easy pickings for a lion, wouldn't you say? Yeah. That's the condition. The devil is interested in getting the body of Christ into the condition of a Christian that is blind and naked. The Bible says you're supposed to be like a soldier armed with armor circumspect, uh, opposing and resisting the devil. The devil's goal is, like I said, not just to kill you, but to, uh, but to get you in a condition where you take all your armor off. Where you start uh, becoming blind to the things of God. A person that's in that condition is absolutely, positively, unquestionably, zero threat to the devil. Yeah. What threat do you think a blind, naked person is to a 300-pound African lion? No threat at all. As a matter of fact, you know, a lot of these uh, big concern, uh, uh, contemporary churches, that's exactly the condition that they're in. They're Laodicean that's churches. The and uh, it's, not that it's not to be uh, harsh or to be judgmental or all these things or anything like that. It's just the fact of the matter. You look at the whole thing and the whole thing is just flesh. The whole thing is entertainment. The whole thing is unscriptural. And so the, the devil has got them in a position where they can uh, uh, accomplish more for his purposes 
And the whole time they think that they're serving God and they're doing absolutely nothing for God because they're operating in the flesh. Now think of this, if, if you're the devil and you're fighting an army of Christians and 90% of that army is blind and naked, who do you think you're going to focus your, your attacks on? You're going to focus your attacks on the remaining 10% that are actually fighting and a threat to you. Because as soon as you take out that 10%, the remaining 90% is easy, easy pickings, right? Okay, so I believe that the King James Bible-believing Christians are the final fighters of the church age, just like we saw in that video. Yeah. Um, Christians who use other Bibles, you know, they might still try to fight. And I'm not saying that there's other people that don't do anything. They're trying to fight, but listen, they've got a faulty weapon. They've got a gun that misfires. They've got a bent sword when they're trying to fight because they've been tricked by the devil into having a false Bible. And uh, there's a handful of Christians in some of these contemporary churches that might still try to fight, but they're severely compromised by the world. Yes. And they've got their armor off. And there's only going to be a certain amount of damage that you're going to do the, to the enemy before he takes you out. Amen. That's, just, that's just the sad state of affairs in these last days. So I believe King James Bible believers are, for the most part, most part the last line of resistance before the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. That's why it's so important to make scriptural decisions in your life. Amen. It is very critical. It's so important to watch out for apostasy in the church. It's important to keep sin out of the home, to keep worldliness out of the church. We're in the critical hour and the battle is intensified and will continue to intensify and more and more Christians are going to fall into sin and worldliness and apostasy. And as the day of Jesus Christ draws closer, it becomes even more imperative for us to be sober and to be vigilant. Amen. Mm -hmm. Because there is a roaring lion that, lion that walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now turn to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. And I just want to point out a couple things about the devil's attacks. If you can recognize the devil's attacks, you can resist the attacks. Now the Bible said to resist the devil. But frankly, how are you going to resist the devil if you don't even recognize the devil? Mm -hmm. Now, the, the Sun Tzu wrote the book, The Art of War, and the statement he makes in that book is that all warfare is deception. Yeah. All warfare is deception. He points out in that book that you're, you, do, you, you would be better off and you, can do, you, you win in a better way and you do more damage to the enemy if you can destroy the enemy not by physical force but by mental prowess. By tricking the enemy into, into maneuvering into the wrong place or into attacking itself, um, you're so much better off if you, can do, if you can fight that mental battle. And when it comes to this battle against the devil, it is a mental battle. It is a battle of the mind, a battle of the wits, if you will. And in Luke chapter 4, you notice that there's not this epic sword fight. There's not this uh, karate ninjutsu <laughs> fight between Jesus Christ and the devil, although that would be awesome. <laughs> what we have here in the Bible is it's a war of words. Yes. Yeah. It's a war of words. It's a war of wits. And in Luke chapter 4, I believe, here you have the temptation of Jesus Christ in the wilderness. And I don't think the devil was just kind of like, well, you know, I'm, I'll, I'll kind of give it a shot. You know, see what I got against him. Uh, Jesus Christ at this point had been fasting for 40 days. He's in a physically weakened yep. position. And I believe that the devil threw the, the hardest the biggest, everything the devil had at his disposal, yeah. he used in this circumstance. He's not going to take any chances. No, this, is, this is the maximum that he has to offer against Jesus Christ. And I think, <clears throat> obviously, we can look at these temptations, and undoubtedly you've heard probably a lot of sermons, a lot of teaching on this, whether on the radio or in the church. And, you know, we can talk about how, you know, the devil went for the world, the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life in these circumstances. But I'm going to show you something here that I think is a little bit more in-depth. I'm going to show you something here that I think is a little more subtle about what the devil was trying to do. All right, so it says in verse 1, it says, And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it may be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. All right, so he says here, If thou be the Son of God. Now, maybe somebody could argue that the devil was trying to get Jesus to question 
his sonship. I don't really think that's the case because Jesus Christ, the Bible says, from when he was 12 years old, knew that he was the Son of God. There's this philosophy, this teaching, this theology that says, well, Jesus Christ, you know, he never really knew if God was really his Father, and he kind of grew into that as he got older. Nonsense. The Bible says in Luke 2.49 that when his mother and his father came looking for him, he said, what, know you not that it must be about my father's yeah. business? Amen. So he was 12 years old, and he knew who his father was. Um, but for the sake of spiritual application, let me just... Uh, uh, point this out for just a moment. The devil will try to get you to question your sonship. If I can just make a spiritual application. Um, if thou be the son of God. Are you the son of God? He'll, he'll try to get you to start thinking things like, uh, you know what, did I repent right? You know, did I pray the sinner's prayer right? Yeah, uh, right. Did I did I do everything right? Did I did I uh, you know did I repent right? Did I believe right? Am I really saved? You know, or you commit some sin in your life, and here comes these condemnation oh. thoughts that say a saved person would never have done that. Yes, a saved person would never have thought that or never have said that. You must not be saved. You must have uh -huh. lost your salvation. You quench the Holy Spirit. You blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And he'll get a lot of Christians all messed up thinking that they're not saved. The, th the fact of the matter is, I don't know if you've ever struggled with doubt of your salvation. I personally have. And I went through years of just not knowing. And the fact of the matter is, um, when you're going through that kind of turmoil, you have to remember that there are spirits that speak to you, and there's God's spirit that speaks to you, and the devil's spirit that speaks to you. When the Holy Spirit speaks to you, he will speak to you very clearly. Mm -hmm. He will have the Bible to back it up. And the Holy Spirit doesn't play games with your mind. The Holy Spirit, if you're lost, the Holy Spirit will say, you are lost, you are headed to hell, and this is why you're a sinner, and this is what you need to do to fix it. It will be very, very clear. The devil's voice, however, will be a voice of confusion. It will be a voice that gives you a bunch of questions, but then never really gives you any kind of answers. It will be very, uh, very ambiguous. The Bible says the God, that God is not the author of confusion. So if you have all these confusing thoughts in your head about God and about salvation in the Bible, you have to realize that that's not the way the Holy Spirit operates. The, the, the Word of God is yea and nay, amen? Yeah, that's good. All right, so that stuff's from the devil. If he can get you questioning your salvation, that's just one more way that he can neutralize you. A Christian that's que that doesn't even know they're saved isn't going to uh, be telling others how to be saved. <laughs> I mean, it's not going to be very effective. I mean, why, how, why would anybody want to get saved and have the faith that you have if you don't even know where you're going when you die? Right? So the way to get victory over the devil is to actively use and claim specific scriptures by faith, which is exactly what Jesus Christ did in this situation. Now, as I said in Luke 4, I don't think the devil was trying to get Jesus to, quit, to doubt who he was. I don't think that was it. I think it's more subtle than that. I think he was trying to cast uh, doubt and uh, uh, get Jesus Christ to question, or let me say this, I think he was trying to get Jesus to trick Jesus Christ into proving who he was. Yeah. Let me put it that way. I think he was trying to get trick Jesus Christ into proving who he was. It goes like this. Jesus knew who he was. The devil knew who he was. And the devil is now challenging Jesus' claim. Okay? And the deception goes like this. The devil says, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones that he be made bread. So if I don't answer the challenge, it'll prove that he's right. He just said, if you're the Son of God, do this. Yeah. And if I don't do that, then therefore, by default, that means I'm not the Son of God. Mm -hmm. He's putting him into that kind of reverse psychology situation. And uh, the devil is obviously not right, but I'm going to prove he's not right by doing this. And a lot of Christians fall for that. For example, the devil will come along and he'll say, maybe say to you, you're a, you're a lovey-dovey Christian. And, and as Bible believers, we're like, no, I'm not. Yeah. He says, yeah, you are. And he says, no, I'm not. He says, prove it to me. Prove you're not a lovey-dovey Christian. Good. So you go out and you pull your sword and you cut off the first uh, Laodicean Christian's head. Uh -huh. You find. And uh, you say, ha, ah, I proved. I, see, I'm not a lovey-dovey Christian. Awesome. I showed you. And they'll say, yeah, yeah, you're right. And here you have this, this Christian spiritually laying dead on the ground that you just hacked to pieces. And that was the whole purpose of the temptation yes. initially. It was a reverse psychology that you fell for. 
Um, the second, here's another one. You're a you're a Bible thumper. You know, you are just way too hard on people. And uh, if you're in the ministry over at the church I'm at, you know, sometimes you know I like to preach hard, and sometimes those thoughts come in my mind, like, man, was I too hard this Sunday? Did I go over the top this Sunday? And the devil will tell you, you know what? You went too hard. You're you're a yep. Bible thumping Christian. You need to. And you say, no, no. I'm, well, I'm not, I'm not trying to be too hard on people. I'm just trying to preach the word of God. No, no, you're 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 too hard on people. Yeah. And so you know what? You happen. You say, no, no, I'm not. And he says, prove it then. And so you know what pastors start to do? They start tolerating sin. They start compromising. They, st they quit opening their mouth. They quit uh, preaching hard against sin. And you showed him that you're not a Bible thumper. But now you're going down the path of Laodicea. Yes. You see? You see, it was a reverse psychology. He got you. Um, this particular one, this type of thinking, can be prevalent in people who have had molestation in their backgrounds. And over the years, I've heard of a lot of Christians with this, uh, with, who struggle with this scenario. Um, as you know, the, 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 the devil can put thoughts into your head. He can put images into your head. The normal thinking of the human mind is very, uh, very structured, is very... Um, Oh, what's the word? It works in a normal operating way. When you get those images and those thoughts that just instantly enter into your mind, that's not the normal thinking of the, of the human mind. That's right. um, when you're reading your Bible, and you've probably all had this happen, you're just reading your Bible, and then out of the blue, just some crazy, wicked thought enters your mind. Yeah, that's not the normal functioning of your mind. That's coming from somewhere else. Yes. Okay, you need to understand that. And so you got all these images all around. You got all this stuff on the TV and the magazines and the billboards. Let's just say the devil sticks some homosexual thought into your mind. And he says, uh, you just thought that thought. You're a queer. You say, no, I'm not. That's disgusting. I don't think about that stuff. Get that stuff out of my mind. He says, you just thought that. And, and he says, you know, he starts condemning you. And he, say, and, he, and he says, okay, now, if you're not, well, then prove it. And so what a lot of people do is they try to compensate for those kind of thinking yeah. by thinking of lustful thoughts to try to compensate for that, that uh, homosexual thought. You say, that doesn't happen. Yes, it does. I've heard a lot of Christians go down the road and get hooked on pornography because they're trying to compensate and, and, and prove to whoever, themselves, the devil, the universe, that they were not that way. And so they ended up getting hooked on porn. And that was the whole point. The devil wasn't trying to get you to go down the road of homosexuality. He's trying to get you hooked on porn. Yeah. But that's how he did it. it. It's reverse psychology. This is how the, the devil will use it on women. He'll say, you know what? You're a weak woman. You know, you're just a doormat. You're, you're one of those lame women that lets themselves just get pushed around by, by anybody. And you say, no, I'm not. I'm not like that. And he says, oh, yeah, you are. And, and you say, no, 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 I don't think I am. He says, okay, then, then prove it. And so, you know, what women start to do, they try to prove themselves. They, they try to prove that I'm not a doormat, and so I'm going to start opposing. I'm not going to submit to my husband. We need to be 50-50 in this relationship. I'm going to start throwing my weight around. And the whole time you just fell for the devil's temptation. That's right. You don't have to prove yourself to the devil. Yeah. You don't have to prove yourself to the devil. That, those are subtle attacks that the devil will use to mess you up. Um, this happened to me down at PBI. Um, while I was a student at PBI, you know, we, uh, uh, you know, we go to class four nights a week. We go street preaching on Saturday. I was at every s service the church had. And, you know, I was married when I went down to PBI. I had, I had two little babies. We had, we had Israel. He was a little baby when we went. And then we had Judah while we were there. And so, you know, I had a family. I had a full-time job. I was going to class all these nights of the week. And there was a lot of single guys like Brother Kim, you know, probably going down to, you know, all over the place, preaching, soul winning. You know, the guys would go down to the beach and lead like 50 people to the Lord. And they would go down to Beale Street. They would go down to Alabama. Every free waking moment they had, they were leading people to Christ, you know. And so I'm sitting there at church one day, and uh, this, this thought says, uh, you're not doing anything for God. Now, that's where I sort of stopped it right there because that was not true. Yeah. The, the, the Lord's not going to lie. Where does the lie come from? It comes from the devil. Amen. The fact of the matter, I was, I was. I was preaching. I was doing everything I could. But I also had a family that I needed to minister at the to, at, to at the time. But I fell for it. And I thought, man, I'm not doing anything for God. I'm not leading people to Christ left and right. And so you know what I did? With all the time that I had, I was already, you know, my wife was already starting to lose her mind <laughs> as it was. You know, PBI is tough on wives. And so, you know, during Sunday afternoon, that was kind of our time to just be together, be alone, not do anything. And I ended up signing up for the jail ministry, which was Sunday afternoons. And it was way out. We had to drive an hour and a half to get there, you know, and all this stuff. And it ended up taking up my whole afternoon. And the whole time, basically, I was trying to prove to myself or 
to whoever I perceived was thinking this of me. I was trying to prove, look, I am zealous for God. I am sold out for God. But the whole time, the devil was trying to trick me into, into destroying my marriage, I believe. Amen. You, know? Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a lot of Christians in the ministry. If, if your marriage ends, that's a hard thing to recover from. There's a lot of bitterness, a lot of unforgiveness, and that stuff's going to quench the Holy Spirit. There's child support involved. There's custody battles, not to mention the kids themselves. A lot of Christians don't recover from that kind of thing. And I think that's what the devil is trying to do. The devil didn't use a woman to try to mess me up, you understand. He used a ministry Wow. to try to mess me up. I, God, God wasn't telling me, go get involved in the jail ministry. Mm -hmm. That was the devil trying to That's do right. that. That's good. You say the devil will try to get you involved in ministry? Yeah. Yes, sir. He will to, to mess you up. You got, that's why you got to be close to the Lord. You got to be in the book. You got to be following the Holy Spirit and understand that there is going to be another voice trying to mess you up. Amen. And that's why you got to try the spirits, like the Bible says. All right. The next thing is in verse six. He says, "And the devil, set, uh, the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore." will worship me, all shall be thine. So basically, the, be the devil isn't offering a 50-50 deal here. He's going to give Jesus Christ 100%, and he's going to keep zero for himself. He's going to give him everything. And uh, a selfish person would say, yeah, man, give it to me. I want all of it. But you know what? I don't think he was appealing to the selfishness of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ didn't have any selfishness. I don't think Jesus Christ was looking at that those kingdoms and lusting after him thinking, man, I could no. man, I could, I could have all that for myself. That's not that, that that's the kind of temptation for maybe some backslidden Christian. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, that's not I don't believe that's what he was trying to do to Jesus Christ here. That would have been a lame temptation. Yeah. Why, if you're the devil, why would you do that? Yeah. All right? I think what he was doing here wasn't in terms of selfishness, but if we look at it in terms of a spiritual opportunity. Yeah. Think about this. Think if if this was presented to any normal Christian, if, if I could have all the kingdoms of the earth, I could enforce morality on the planet. Yeah, if I had all the kingdoms of the earth, I could, uh, I could issue executive orders to enforce conservatism. I could end communism across the planet and enforce democracy. We could put Hillary Clinton in jail if I had all the kingdoms of the earth. You know, I could enact a global campaign and eliminate ISIS. Think of all the people I could help yeah. if I just listen to the devil and I do the thing that's wrong. Um, if I had all the authority and the power and the devil had none, I could actually defeat the devil. Mm -hmm. ha, that fool, he doesn't even realize that he's giving me the keys to the kingdom and I'm actually going to defeat him if I just take him up on his offer. He doesn't even, under, he doesn't even get it. Ha, I'm going to trick the devil. And the, and the temptation is that you think you're going to outsmart the devil. The devil knows exactly what he's doing. Amen. If Jesus had taken all the kings of the world for the purpose of defeating the devil, would he have been successful? Absolutely not. He would, the devil would have defeated Jesus Christ in the yeah. fact that he had fallen for the sin. Yeah. Um, you are not going to outsmart the devil. You are not going to beat him at his game. Mm -hmm. And here's how a lot of it goes. You're, you're not going to take something from the devil and then use it against him. A lot of times the common uh, idea is, oh, hey, here's an opportunity to get rich. I'll have to deviate from the will of God for a little while, but why should the devil have all the money? Have you ever heard people say that? Why should the devil have all the money? Well, the fact of the matter is, number one, the devil doesn't have all the money. God has more money than the devil, okay? <laughs> That's not a problem. All right, but, uh, you know, they say, well, let's take some of the devil's money and use it for God's work. I hope somebody in our church wins the lottery because then we can use that money and think of all that we could do for missions. God doesn't want the lottery garbage money. Uh, ask Gehazi about that sometime. He took the, the lottery money and he got leprosy with it. Destroyed his ministry. Another popular one is, hey, hey man, let's run for political office, let's get our guy into the White House, and then we can change the country from inside. And uh, the fact of the matter is, the Bible says, uh, righteousness exalteth the nation, not republicanism. Um, why would you think that changing the laws would bring about righteousness? Well, you say, well, Josiah had a revival in his day. Kind of. If you look at it closely, he, he enacted a lot of conservative, righteous laws, but as soon as he was dead, the nation went straight back into it. The reason why the people went along with it is because if they didn't, he was going to chop their head off. Right. It wasn't a real revival. No. You say, well, what about Daniel? What about Joseph? What about Esther? Have you ever noticed that those three people who were in political position did not seek 
Yeah. That political position. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God just happened to, God put him in that position through supernatural means. And if that happens, okay. But the fact of the matter is, these people that are seeking political office are outside of the will of God. Yeah. Um, the devil offered Jesus Christ all the kingdoms of the world. Why do you think all these Christians are going after a single kingdom? They want the United States of America, the most powerful kingdoms on earth. Jesus Christ could have had all the kingdoms, and he turned it down. What are they doing going after one kingdom? You see, the Bible sheds a lot of light on this Capital Connection ministry in Washington, D.C. Amen. I don't have a problem saying that. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> the final thing is, uh, if you look at verse uh, 8, Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And then in verse 9, he says, And he brought him to Jerusalem, and set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. All right? So I'm keeping an eye on time here, but uh, this is a very deep level of deception. Here what the devil's doing is he's actually using Scripture mm -hmm. to try and get Jesus Christ to do something that's wrong. Yeah. And this is the kind of condition that a lot of people that are involved in cults get messed up with. Because when a person has the Word of God as their authority to justify their actions, it is extremely difficult to ever change that person from that belief because they feel like they're obeying God when in reality they're serving the devil. Um, this is very common in, con in contemporary churches where they speak in tongues. Well, the Bible, tongues are in the Bible, so I'm going to start speaking in tongues, I'm going to start speaking gibberish, and the whole time it's the devil that's using them. And you can't convince them otherwise, it seems like, no matter how hard you try, because they have their verse. They have their experience. I know what I felt. Uh-huh. And so you can't get through to them. And here you have a person, here you have a probably a born-again Christian who is not only neutralized and not effective for God, but is actually fighting against the work of God, thinking that they're serving the Lord. Yeah. The whole time they're walking down the path hand-in-hand hand with who they think is God, yeah. but is really the devil. The devil with a mask of Jesus on. You know who some of the most outspoken opponents of street preaching are? Born-again Christians. Yeah. Uh, you know who the most outspoken opponents of the King James Bible are? Usually it's born-again Christians. Yeah. Saved born-again Christians who think they're serving God but are led by the devil. You see, the devil's going to mimic and counterfeit the Holy Spirit. And you have to understand that. The devil will speak to you just like the, the Lord will speak to you. And, and uh, as far as trying to get victory over these things, number one, the Bible gives you authorization to try the spirits. The Bible says, try the spirits to see whether they have God, because uh, not every spirit is of God. That's 1 John chapter 4. I didn't quote it right. But the Bible says, try the spirits. It's okay to ask questions. When you get these thoughts coming in your mind, if maybe you feel like the Lord's leading you to do something, or to start a ministry, or to go somewhere, quit your job to do this or do that, the Bible gives you the authorization to try that spirit. It's okay. It, a lot of times, if the devil's speaking to you and trying to get you to do something, the moment you say, well, I don't know if I should. I don't know if I should jump off the pinnacle of the temple. And instantly, here comes this voice that says, what, you don't have any faith? What, you, you're calling me a liar? You don't think that God is capable of keeping you safe? You see how that works? Now, sometimes God will lead you to do some things that are very crazy. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, you know, we, 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 you have Gideon. The Lord allows you to try the spirits, and the Lord will allow you to wait and remain neutral until He confirms it through His Word, through preaching, through the body of Christ. It's okay to remain neutral until you get the answer. It is okay. The devil is going to be saying, no, you need to jump right now. You need to jump right now. Don't think about it. God will catch you. Do it now. Do it now. Do it now. The Bible talks about the devil driving that maniac of Gadara into the wilderness. And the Holy Spirit leads. Uh, I don't, there are times where the Holy Spirit will drive, but most of the time, in general, the Holy Spirit is leading you, not driving you. And I say that because there's one one part in the in the account in Mark, the Holy Spirit driveth Jesus into the wilderness. So there are going to be those times, but most of the time the Holy Spirit leads and the devil's spirit drives. All right, so lastly, the Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. If it's from God, then follow it. When he gives you the uh, when he gives you the verification that this is from God, then you need to do it. 
don't throw out 50 fleeces, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, hoping for a different answer. <laughs> you know, after two fleeces, three fleeces, you need to have some faith and That's do what right. the Lord says. Uh, but if it's from the devil, you need to recognize it as such, Amen. and you need to resist it and ask God for the grace to be able to do so. Let's pray. Hello, this is Pastor Gene Kim of San Jose Bio Baptist Church. Have you ever asked this question that if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you can go to heaven? My friend, it's so simple to get saved. You first got to realize that you can't go to heaven because you've sinned against God. And God, as a holy judge, he has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you feel sorry over your sinful condition. And if you do, there is hope for you. You see, Jesus, who is God, left heaven, came down here on earth, died on the cross, raised himself from the dead. Why did he do all that? So his blood can wash away the sins for you. So you see, that's your only way to heaven, of what he did on the cross, and not what you do in cleaning up all your sins, and going to church, getting baptized, or doing any sort of good work. It's faith alone in what Jesus did on the cross. If you can do that, then all you have to do is say that to God. You might say, well, I don't know how to say it. Can you help me out? Sure, you can say it this way. Dear God, I am sorry for being a sinner. I believe Jesus is God who died and resurrected so his blood can wash away my sins. I trust in that alone and not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Congratulations, my friend. If someone were to ask you, how did you get saved? It's very simple, right? What did you do? I just put my faith on what Jesus did on the cross. That's it. My friend, congratulations on your salvation. Right now, because Satan can't damn you to hell, what he's going to try to do now is try to ruin your life. And he did a very good job in this world. That's why it's so hard to find truth, and there are so many lies with a gazillion different churches, different Bibles, different beliefs, different religions. So my friend, it is so important to grow in truth and get involved in a Bible-believing work that can save you from a lot of trouble. There are four things we recommend for you to do, which is found in the resources link below. Number one, get involved in a Bible-believing church near you. Number two, Study the King James Bible issue and have only that kind of Bible, no other modern version Bible. Number three, study dispensationalism so you can find the right doctrine and truth. Number four, study only under Bible-believing teachers. My friend, this is all explained further in the resources link below, so please click on it and get to work in a Bible-believing work because you only have one light to live for him and you don't want to waste it away by the devil. And I'll be inside that great palace and the smoke will be so thick. I'll drop to my knees and I'll drop to my face like those Navy SEALs do. And I'll start crawling. I'll start crawling. And I'll look down that uh, ivory aisle there and I'll see a, a throne. And I'll see some feet that got holes in them and they got jewel sandals on. Then I'll pull myself up to those feet and I'll cry on those feet like that woman that cried on his feet and wiped the tears with her hair. Hey, glory to God, you're going to let him do the shining. You're going to say, oh God, thank you. Hallelujah. And the angels will worship and the cherubim will worship and the seraphim will worship and thank God an independent Baptist will worship. Another song said, Once I was straying in sin's dark valley, no hope within could I see. They searched through heaven and found a Savior Amen. to save us. Glory to oh, soul like me. Woo! Glory to God. He stood out there in my Sodom and he's go, Ho, ho, ho! Jesus saves! <laughs> the Bible saves from God's. And he's preaching, and the, and the people that's ringing the bell, they be, uh, uh, <laughs> And he'd stand up, and, uh, and people walk up and they said, Wow, Santa Claus preaching. What? Then you enter the throne of glory. Yeah. Oh, the Father opens up his arms. Come on, there's a banner raised up in the sky with all the angels. You're going to catch it.
the name of Jesus Christ. It's not through Mohammed. He did not do anything for you. It's not through Buddha. It's not through the commandments. It's only through faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, I'm, I'm just going to stay still and I'm just study at home. Uh, uh, I, watch, I watch preaching on the TV. Uh, uh, you can turn the preacher off. You ain't going to turn me off. like your skin turning to gold or something, you don't know what's going on. He's about two more steps, here's that crowd. Hi, how you doing? Hey, Mom. Hi, Dad. Hey, Steve. Hey, Steve. Hey, like that? Way down there at the edge of that street, there's the Lord of said glory. And down he comes off that throne. He always would come down for a sinner. <laughs> and he comes down there, well done, now, good and faithful servant of the joy of our Lord. Now, old boy's heart going down there, it says, Forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Then he laid down on that table, and Dr. Grace got out the scalpel, and he removed that old cold stony heart out of my friend. Oh, he threw it in the trash can, and he put a brand new heart into my friend's chest. And when he when he woke up, uh, he looked around and he said, "Oh my." Everything has been changed. Everything looks different. Oh, I'm so happy now that I had the heart operation. Hey, praise God, there's no other Savior like 